Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this meeting. Um, and so let's start off with uh, action items. Floating point to integer casts. Did this ever happen? I feel like there was some movement here. We um, added an FCP uh, to stabilize the an unsafe function due to the cast and that should be in the stabilization should be happening about now. But is it, this action item is is it still relevant? Seems like it's maybe not. I don't know. I do think it is. Um, as far as I know, there's no concrete summary that this is like within this meeting we have discussed that we believe that this is the last remaining roadblock to stabilizing or i guess changing the behavior to the safe by default behavior but i don't think that we've posted a summary of why we think this is the right decision to make and so forth and certainly to my knowledge there's not been an fcp of the of that right yes that's true okay so we'll leave it there I the thoughts to the flow to, to int unchecked thing is in a roll up. So, yes, it's going to land soon. Okay. That's good. I wrote up some, we'll come to this point later. These other items I don't think have been done. Um, so, we should decide some design meetings. I don't know if we want to take meeting time for it now. We could. Let's, let's do it towards the end and we can do it if necessary on. Uh, on Zulip, I'll come back to that. We don't have a meeting plan for next week, though. Um, or we don't have a meeting, yeah, unless we plan one now. Uh, any updates here on any of these items? Inline We've assembly. had no updates for two weeks on inline assembly. Um, I think we might want to look towards possibly making a decision on the RFC. Yes. Since it seems to be more or less done at this point. There's no more feedback coming in. So I yes, I think that would be good. I asked Central if since I think that was the main point, if we and we Central and I already talked about getting feedback this coming week. Right, I pinged you yesterday. Uh yep. so that would be great if that's possible. Um yeah, I'll do my best. Trying uh, to keep up with emails and stuff. Sorry. Safe transmute. Josh, do you know anything about the current status there? Uh, so I just came back from vacation as of literally today. And one of the first items on my Rust list is to check back in with Ryan. Uh, my uh, understanding is that the current situation is still that they are. Uh, putting together a much reduced proposal in terms of let's see if we can reduce the scope enough to make this simple. Great. And beyond that, I still need to have a conversation with them and find out what that looks like so that I don't uh, retread existing territory by way of being missing and unhelpful. Okay. Sounds good. I think const evaluation, we don't really have an effective loop happening here, but that's okay. Uh, I don't think anything in particular is not things. Okay. So right in terms of FFI in mind, I'll just leave these notes here, but the uh, status here is that we're starting to work on an RFC as far as I know. Um, that we'll propose, as we discussed last time, see unwind, and we'll leave for an exceptions for another time. I think that's the plan. Um, uh, no updates on DIN trait work. I don't think any updates on grammar. I have an action item to reach out to the grammar group. I didn't do it, but I can do that later. Um, there was. Um Discussion and work sort of restarted a bit. Okay. Uh, in the in the Discord, and there were some some work with PRs. 
like updating the definition of, of the grammar to to what we actually have in, in the browser. Updating the what in the grammar? The the grammar definition that we have collected so far to reflect the the actual grammar in in uh, in the parser. So like adding adapting to changes or additions that have been made in the meantime. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, that's good. Should okay. Probably uh, you should probably discuss anyways. Should I still write up this proposal? <laughs> Or like, should I remove that action item, or should I still write up, reach out, and it, kind of get an inquire? It's probably well. a good idea to to talk to ADB. I would say. Still. All right. Never type stabilization. Um, I left a comment with some alternative plans to experiment with. Um, I can briefly. I won't go over the implementation details, but something that's worth pointing out is that you know this is a lint <laughs> there's no perfection here we can't detect uh, and in particular the way i yeah. propose it at least for example it would not complain about a case like this where the t and this is the example where you why you would not want to complain the t here is ultimately prop changed into a, a never type because of fallback as at least the way to compile this implemented today, panic yields a unbound inference variable that gets unified altogether, and that's okay. But it would be possible to have behavior inside this function body that, you know, works for a unit but doesn't work for never type, in some sense, or is UB for never type and not for unit, and we wouldn't detect that case, right? Um, but I don't. We don't know of any examples that. In fact, all the examples I've seen that. Uh, it's intra-procedural. Um, so that's sort of the shape of the lint that I proposed. Uh, so one aspect, and one aspect which I liked about Aaron's PR is that uh, it was fairly um, like self-contained. It didn't um, add small bits of code everywhere in the type checker. Um, it would be good to, to sort of retain that property if possible so that we don't have too much technical debt to clean up in the future. I'm not sure. An interesting question is whether this is debt or investment because the, so the, the exact thing I'm, I'm looking at is if you wind up with some live node whose type is a type variable, is a never, whose type winds up becoming never because of fallback, you get a warning. And I kind of think you n never want that. <laughs> like, so are you, so is the idea to do, since you mentioned divergence, are you going to do this in the type checker or, or on, on mirror? It's done in the type checker. Um, right. So this, you can't do it in mirror because mirror lacks the information it needs. Uh, I see. To make, like you need to know whether this never type came from fallback or not. And that's right. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, the, I guess all I'm saying is I don't, I think this is not too invasive, but I could see this just being a lint we want to keep because it indicates sort of potentially surprising behavior, um, even if their transition had happened years ago, it would still be true. Yeah, I guess it depends on how complicated it is to, to actually implement. Right. So hopefully we'll get some takers on toying with that implementation. I don't think it'd be too much code, but that's good. Um, I don't think Felix is here. I'm here, but I don't have the report, but instruction set. Okay. So key high issues. I don't have any updates on these things. I'm supposed to prepare a write up. I've not done it, but I would like to. But for nominated PRs. Uh, Central, did you want to talk about this? The uh, tuple thingy. Mm -hmm. So, um, David Olney uh, is proposing that we accept tuple dot 
uh, some field index got some field index in the grammar somehow. Um, and this PR is specifically doing it through um, through some lexer adjustments, uh, which is one approach. And another approach. And so so uh, what currently happens is that we have uh, int int uh, sorry ident dot uh, float as the set of uh, as the list of tokens. Um, and so this changes that to produce ident dot integer dot integer, um, which means that the parser just handles it correctly. Um, another approach would be to do it via like how we break up glue tokens like uh, ampersand ampersand is broken up to ampersand and then you have another ampersand to consume later. Uh, and this is sort of what Pajin Group is suggesting that we would do instead. Of course, there's the question, do we want to do this at all? So are um, these, I'm, I'm trying to understand the, the analogy here. I would think that the ampersand ampersand, it's, it's significant. There's no white space looking two ampersands, no, so right? Just, the whole point there. And for, but this case, if you won't be able to have white space between the, the periods and the zeros, right? I don't understand the analogy, I guess I'm just saying. Um, So I think the issue here, if I understand correctly, is that um, we have to handle things like uh, reference to reference to foo, with like ampersand ampersand foo, which should parse as two single unary ampersand operators. And separate from that, we also have the and and operator for right. logical yes. and. And so the lexer needs to have, you know, rather than teach the lexer and parser to fundamentally interact. My understanding from this is that we lex as two individual ampersands and then later on glue that together and say, oh, mm -hmm. this is actually the binary operator. No, it's I, the opposite, actually. Um, oh, we, I see. We lex it as ampersand, as the double ampersand and then yes. later treat it as though we had seen two single ampersand. Yes, there is a function break and eat. Um, that, that does that. Okay. So along the same lines, it sounds like the proposal here is to go ahead and lex this as the floating point number 0, 0.0 and then later break it up into, oh, this was really dot zero dot zero. So that is what Petrochenko is proposing, but this is not that. That is not what this PR is doing. What this PR okay. is doing is actually um, changing okay. the the token stream. Now I understand. Uh, in the lexer, uh, I, I believe uh, Matt Child is uh, not exactly sure what they were. Um, let's see. I think I, I'm not sure if Matt Cloud's second approach is. Also, what Petrochenko is suggesting, but he, um, but I, I think it's the same, and he is preferring not to do it in the next as well. Right, so there's still some um, question about the right approach, but it's okay. Yeah, there's also a question: Do we want to do, allow this? Um, Nico suggested that we didn't in the past, like years years ago. Uh, it didn't seem worth complicated hacks in the lexer at the time. Uh, so I will observe the similarity to, I'm sorry, please go ahead and finish, Nico. I didn't mean to interrupt. That's okay. Uh, I, I would adjust my opinion now for two reasons. First of all, we've lived with it for a while, and I don't know, I've, I've certainly encountered cases where it's annoying. Uh, I think it's a minor annoyance, but also that we have sort of ideas and technology we didn't have before, like these, the approach that we've used to break up complex lex tokens into simpler ones is something we do already. So if we can find an elegant way to integrate it, I think we should do it. Yeah. Implement, uh, for, from an implementation you know, complexity perspective, this is pretty simple. Um, like if you just look at the lines of code, it's quite simple. Um, there, there, there was one point made. Uh, I personally think this um, it's quite reasonable to to support this in, in some fashion. Uh, but there was a point to to 
uh, make the counter argument. Um, there was a point before that um, it's a good idea not to allow this because um, having uh, tuples in like it's, it's typically not not very good for readability to have tuples and tuples and in indexing to them. Um, I don't know. I, I don't personally buy into that kind of, I mean, I could, I think it's a weak argument. Let's put it that way. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with it myself. Using code, but auto-generated code and other things may be perfectly reasonable. And I don't know. I feel like people will self-regulate. <laughs> They'll find a way to write yeah. obfuscated code. If it's not this one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Josh, you were saying something, but you. Oh, um, I was going to briefly observe that the C++ community has had many issues regarding the uh, uh, greater than, greater than uh, being interpreted as the uh, right shift operator versus uh, two ending tokens of the close angle bracket for a template and has gone through similar levels of turmoil to get rid of that and deal with it. So I was simply observing that it seemed of similar levels of importance to uh, deal with something like this early rather than letting it become a long-standing wart uh, in terms of language orthogonality. The other question I was going to ask was, is there or has anybody done any grammar analysis to figure out, is there any legitimate parse of a, like outside of a macro, in which a floating point number follows a dot in a legitimate parse of Rust. I'm having trouble coming up with an actual scenario for that. No, that doesn't seem like a valid. Uh, I was going to suggest that if that's the case, we might theoretically be able to hint to the lexer that if it happens to see dot followed by floating point number, that it should interpret it not as a floating point number, but as dot integer dot integer. And that might simplify things if we can simply make sure that floating point number is not something that can follow dot in any legitimate parse. But, um, that, that's, uh, that's what the PR does. Really. Okay, then I completely misunderstood, sorry. So, so if, if, so, let me copy paste one thing. So, shall we move on? I mean, it seems like we are arguing about how to implement and that better done on the PR somehow. I mean, it is it does reflect in the language spec in some sense, but uh, so it doesn't. There doesn't seem to be anyone who objects to the I idea itself of supporting this in some, some way. I think these things would be relevant in the sense that, if I'm not mistaken, or something I would find useful is to discuss how rock macros will see these tokens, which I think would be potentially affected by different choices we make here. But. Yeah, Petrochenko has some comments around that, I think. I guess that makes it technically a backwards and compatible change too, probably. If you handle it in the parser, then I believe there shouldn't be any problems with the macros. Because they only get a token stream and the parser consumes token streams. What and if you don't if change... If we change the token stream they receive in some way, as I think the current PR does. I'm not yeah. i about this, but technically... Uh, there might be some procedural macro that observes the difference. Yeah. So doing it in the parser would probably be strictly, strictly speaking more backwards. When you say doing the parser, you mean doing what Petr Chenkov is suggesting about yes. the lazily yes. splitting? Okay. Yes. Yeah. But perhaps I would be a bit surprised if someone actually relied on that. So. Would be surprising. But then again, the thing that People I've seen, do weird the things. thing we've seen from time to time is 
people doing it precisely to work around the language feature that we're now implementing. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that many times. Uh, at least that's happened with macros in the past. Where it's like we were using a macro to emulate the syntax that you now added, and now the macro is broken because it parsed correctly. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I remember this all too well with all patterns. Okay, so let's so let's keep going. So what do we want? So what are we doing here? Are we so no one? Maybe the conclusion from the meeting is no one is objecting objecting to the idea, um, but maybe we, we we would want to see an implementation in, towards what in the style that Petr Tenkov is suggesting. Perhaps uh, perhaps we would want that instead. Not entirely for it. Yes. At least, at least exploring it seems prudent. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree with that. I I feel like there's um yes. I think this would be where if we had a really robust, you know, grammar working group or at least a more fully developed grammar, there might be more precedent to draw on. I would want to do it as naturally as possible. But, um, yes. I'm not sure how we um in particular doing it in the parser. Anyway, let's keep going, but I think that'll sound Can we, I'll leave a who's comment. Who's leaving this What? Who's leaving that comment? So I just wanted to double check on this foreign exceptions. Uh, I think the consensus from our last meeting was that we were going to leave the we wanted to, we would prefer to abort for now, but leave the documentation as saying the behavior is unspecified and may change in the future. Um, or it's undefined behavior and we expect to change it in the future and point to the FFI online working group, for example. Um, yeah. And the idea was we would use an abort because that is less likely to be relied upon than other things. That, that's correct. How many are you good with that? Um, yep. I've changed the PR. That's what it does now. Okay. Could you uh, could you follow up with, uh, when the PR lands? Could you follow up with the uh, PRs uh, to the reference and the uh, nomicon as well? What specifically do you want to say? Because I think the consensus is that it's still UB. We just happen to abort. Basically, the same thing you added to to the to the okay. start library docs. Okay. Sure. Just to have it in more places. Uh, Josh suggested the possibility of doing a creator run with tests to see if anyone was relying on the old behavior. Do we think that's well, to be clear, what I'm suggesting is that if we're already talking about writing a PR to uh, change catch unwind to abort, then I'm just suggesting we take the the run that we were already going the. PR we were already going to make and crater it first. Yeah. I mean, presumably someone will need to write that PR first, but. It exists, actually. That's what we're talking okay. about. Okay. Then, yes. Basically. It's this one. That seems fine to me. It takes a little while, but. Especially it's considering it's a test run. Right. The existing behavior is what? It just skips over the catch unwind completely? Uh, yes, yeah, it just unwinds past it. Yeah. I mean, I think we're definitely not going to preserve that behavior in any case. That sort of seems pretty clear to me. That's not, that's not good behavior. There is a, a slight code size overhead to the PR, but only for the MSVC targets because um, previously we would just catch, we would only catch um, rust panic exceptions, but now we catch rust panic exceptions and then catch all other exceptions in a separate clause. Does, does that apply to abort? Um, yes, because we need to be able to differentiate the exception types, which means that basically we generate the equivalent IR of a C++ try catch with two catch clauses. Uh, but only on MSVC. 
I, I should remember this, but I've forgotten. Foreign exceptions, they exist on Linux targets, right? They're not just a Windows. Uh, it's basically it's just, when we say foreign exception, just think C++ exception. Okay, okay. I just want to make sure that running, a creator run is actually going to be meaningful for this. Pattern. Yeah, we're not okay. talking about SEH here. We're talking about uh, um, C++ exceptions or similar unwind mechanisms. Those happen to have some unification on MSVC targets, I believe. I, yeah, I guess that in contrast to the cases where we saw before, where we saw people rely on panics, uh, there is sort of no correct version of this code, in my view. Uh, like, the catch unwind is there probably to do something, and it's not that you would ever want it to not activate. I guess the correct version might be that the Intermediate library repropagates or something. Yeah. That is something that I've considered doing and I have half implemented in a branch, but it gets a bit complicated because we do not want to dip, have a dependency on C runtime. Yeah, right. I think we should just do the crater run though. I don't know. How long does it take? A few days? A week? Yeah, I think one argument in favor of the crater run is this is the sort of thing that we're sort of very likely to miss on the beta run because it's likely to lead to something like an abort in some libraries tests. Yeah. And generally those are ignored or we look at it and we say, oh, you know, this library is doing something weird. It's hard to uh, track down whether it's like actually a regression given that we usually have, you know, 20 or 30 libraries that do this sort of yeah. sometimes aborting on, you know, every fifth run, who knows? Right. Okay. I'm convinced. I mean, it seems like we know we've had problems in this area. <laughs> Just do the crater run. Be careful. Uh, so. Okay. Uh, moving on. Limit maximum alignment in repper align to 4K. Uh, so these notes are from last time. The crate run is done. Yes. Uh, we have three root regressions. None of them, so they're all doing. Um, heap allocation of types with large alignments. So, well, I mean, we're back to two, to two options. Either we accept the breakage for these three crates or we um, only restrict, uh, only apply the alignment restriction on statics and promoted constants. Um, but that could get tricky for promoted constants because I think that's the post monomorphization error. And yeah, that's number of spaces. So one of them is allocating a sort of pseudo stack so that you can do bit masking on the stack pointer, I guess. But wait, doesn't doesn't the front end know what the supported uh, alignment? The maximum support alignment is. Sorry, what's maximum supported alignment? No, so we, we know the so the maximum support alignment is probably going to end up as a per target setting. Yes, but the front end is aware of this, isn't it? Yes. Right. So why do we need a post monomorphization error in that? Oh, um, if we want to, we want to allow types to have uh, an alignment over 4K, but we just don't want you to allow creating um, statics uh, or so global variables of this type. And um, promoted constants basically have the same restrictions in that they're basically global variables. Yes.
that feels like yet another sort of surprising, like the promoted constant is a case where people wrote, they wrote code that did not put it in a global variable. The compiler opted to create a global variable for your expression and then aborts because that global variable has an alignment that is too big. Yes, but that value now can be coerced to a static lifetime. I, I realize which, is, which would no longer be possible. I'm just saying it's an unfortunate like interaction. Promotion always has unfortunate interactions. It sort of argues, I guess, for at least we've been talking about an explicit syntax to make promotion. Yeah. Happen. Uh, it might argue for at least. I don't know. Might argue in the future for some way to opt out or maybe a change in defaults. I don't know. So, so what are the set of options here? We so list still, all of them. Two, there's still two options. Option one, we disallow the alignment on the types themselves. Option two, we allow these alignments on types, but don't allow creating global variables with them, which is statics and promoted constants. Right. Right. There was a comment about, oh, okay, about locals, and you, you felt dumb on you that we could do that differently? Yeah, that's, uh, that's an LLVM bug, I feel. In, in either of these cases, it would be a per target. It would actually be the fixed constant for k. It would be something per target, right? Yeah. So, the sorry. What, what do you mean? It wouldn't be literally for k. It would be something. It would be a per target. Yeah. Right. I'm just saying for k because that's what it's going to be in practice on most targets. Sure. By the way, point of information. What is h size? Like, what does that stand for? Page. I think it was supposed to be page size. Okay. It's handle size, isn't it? Isn't H for handle? No, no, no. no. It's, I think it oh, was, I said I page size. and it's, I see. That's what I, I get in my head, I thought it must mean page size, but I don't know. Anyway, good. Okay. I think three, three regressions probably for crates that are used that much is not. But not very significant, not for adding a plus one multiplication error, which is like well, something Rust is not supposed to do. I would actually observe uh, alignment by itself is already going to be a somewhat unusual feature, and alignment having like a specific alignment requirement that is large is uh, going to be rarer still. The example that was given at the bottom of this list saying somebody needed like a 32K alignment, for example, is one particular embedded project with specific needs. And leaving aside that I would generally expect specific target embedded projects to be underrepresented in uh, Crater, I would also suggest this is a case of, you know, what fraction of the people who are actually using the feature just got broken. I don't think three is like co acceptable collateral damage here. I think three is a noticeable warning sign that we are have done something we need to pay more attention to. Uh, I agree with that. I would say one other thing, which is I'm interested in the use cases that they put out, uh, which seem to me to be fairly valid. Um, like I would like to have some other way to address so most of them are, so actually all of them, all three of those use dynamic allocation, but I think this is less of an issue nowadays because we have, because the global allocation API is, sta is stable and a lot of this code was written before that. Ah, okay. That's helpful information. Uh, I need to double check the dates on these crates, but I think so, they're all pretty old. So for these embedded targets, um, 
Is there something specific about Stuffix where they support? So for embedded targets, it's not a problem because they use static linking and basically don't rely on the loader to do the right thing. The addresses are fixed by the linker. So, so they, they will could, always have the correct alignment. So they could raise the alignment as high as they want in in probably. So effectively the align attribute here is telling the compiler this will be aligned rather than telling the compiler please align this. Yes. That then is really doesn't, that's interesting. Then um, that doesn't so seem it's not really, well it's the problem is position independent code and operating system loaders that don't respect the alignment constraints. And we use position independent code by default on most targets, except the embedded ones. Right. So there doesn't seem to be a problem with, uh, with the, uh, with the embedded use cases here, then, if we do it per type and not per static, uh, not not enforcing the restriction on those types, but rather on types. So, sir, right, so a middle ground might be a warning period and encouraging people to migrate over to newer stable APIs. Sure. That seems fine. So actually, I, ch I had a look at the crates. They're actually pretty recent. Last update was eight and nine months ago. Which means they will probably up uh, update quicker. That's usually what happens with more recent crates. And two months ago. But like, three regressions is quite a quite few in, in terms of a uh, plus one mm -hmm. of someone in the comments saying they had an embedded use case. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's clear people are going to be impacted by this. I think that's my like. My yeah, I'm just saying if if this were like some, I, I don't know how how relevant a comparison to, for example, the parser is, but if if, if this was like. Few regressions in the parser, we would just land, land the change. You probably wouldn't have a warning period or anything. Okay. Actually, um, I think we could add a third option. Um, allow. Uh, allow you to specify the alignments on these types, but don't allow you to actually create instances of these types. No, actually, never mind. That's still post morphization errors. Yeah. Never mind. I mean, post monomorphization errors of this kind doesn't strike me as so. We also would give an error for a type that winds up being too large. Right? That is extremely unusual. Yeah. That and it's. I mean, one of the very few. To happen have. more often than you aligned this too much. I'm not sure. Yeah, like I'm just saying that kind of exceeding target limits is the kind of thing that we do enforce late. I have never seen someone actually. Uh, Exceed that uh, that target limit um, in actual code. Only like in contrived examples made to actually talk about that that error. Yeah. Okay. I I do tend to agree though that like it, it feels like this is the sort of thing that it's fine to put in post morphization, especially like long term. I would imagine that it might even be the case that like you call the linker. And the linker errors, right? It says you told me to do whatever you asked, and and I'm going to refuse. Now, linkers today might not do that, but one one could imagine sort of a nice linker saying, you know, for this specific target on this device, I can't satisfy this, and that like that can't happen before monetization or even code gen. 
And it also seems like the kind of thing where most projects, like most people that specify this sort of type, like are okay with it claiming to work in cargo check on other platforms. I mean, it's certainly true that all the, well, well, I don't know actually. Are those generic types? Hard to say. What about the consumers of those libraries? Are they also? Um, I'll have a look. From the crater run, there's only two consumers. Okay. So let's just check what else we have on our agenda. It's 40 minutes in. Um, doesn't look like we have any other major things in here coming up. But, uh, basically, what we're disputing about here is. I'd like to try to pull back and summarize kind of what we're saying. There's these two options. And essentially, I think we're saying the this has a pro of sort of simpler uh, overall to say these kind of, there's a limit on how on the max alignment full stop. Um, it's uh, but the con is it triggers regressions in existing code, um, triggers known regressions in existing code. And the pro of this case is, well, it's basically just a con, right? That it, uh, that it has post monomorphization errors. The pro is the opposite of the above, I guess. It's like narrowly tailored, as narrowly tailored as possible to the existing problem. What is disallowed? I'm not, I'm not sure what that I mean, is. that's the same as the first option. I, I wasn't sure, so I, I, I thought I had it, but if it is, then okay. And the observation here is small number, absolute number of errors is small, but as a fraction of users may be significant. Um, but some of them in the embedded cases, uh, the limit for platforms would be high, right? I don't buy that format, that it's uh, significant as the, as a fraction of users. Three is very small. Do you, I mean, you have, <laughs> the math is undeniable. So the question is, what is the denominator, like, uh, it's it's actually five. There's two other crates that are non-root regressions, but close enough. The number of crates that use wrapper align compared to the number of crates that get parsed seems to be clearly a different fraction. Right? Um, I don't know. I do prefer just allowing on the types. It's simpler but I don't like breaking code. Maybe we can contact those great authors and suggest to them they can port over. I don't know, I'd be curious to hear what their take is on that. So from what I've seen of the, um, the actual code, I think most of the higher align, they have um, basically a macro that generates implementations for every possible alignment from one all the way to one gig or so. But I think most of the higher ones are not actually used anywhere. That's so, 
Is that the second crate? Or that That's the, the 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 last two. Interesting. Okay. That's fairly typical to see uh, see in 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 crate refreshes, by the way. Crates that aren't used in general. I mean, the, the the crates are used, but they have implementations for all possible alignments. I'm just saying, most of the higher implementation trait implementations for higher alignments are not used. Well, so they would basically have to just drop those those higher yeah. alignments up. And they can't. Why don't I check the reverse dependencies? They didn't seem used. Okay. They can't really know when. Like, is it just defining the types is getting the errors? In other words, if some targets supported and some don't, that's not something they can. They have to shoot with a common denominator. You use CFG uh, conditional configuration for that. Okay. Yeah, that's true. And the green thread future can be fixed by using the global alloc API. Okay, I, mean, I don't feel like we have to resolve this in this minute. I Should we like to also summary, no. ping the embedded uh, working group and, and see if like they have thoughts as well, yeah. other than just these crate authors? I don't think we've done it yet. I think that would be good. I'd like to post a sort of summary of this this discussion, ping the, ping the embedded working group and uh, crate authors and revisit the question. Who will do that? I am I can write the summary or no. How do we ping the embedded working group? <coughs> do they have like a I'll 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 ping James and tell him to do something. That's what I usually do. <laughs> James and Jorge. I'll try to do that after this meeting. Oops. Unless someone else wants to. Okay. I think do we have other things to discuss? Let's see. Uh, um, the welcomeness thing. All right. So this is a question of do we want to have a design meeting? And if so, who's going to be here? Here are the back of the report. Got these two things we've seen before. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna table that because we said we talked about design meetings at the end. I don't think we'll have time. But people check your boxes on spans. Uh, I think there's there's this nominated issue. I wasn't really clear why this was nominated. I guess just to like let people know. Um, Maybe Esteban is nominating it because they're sort of like asking, does it still apply or something? I guess there's a question of um, this. Yeah, something like that. So I think what this PR does. It's an issue. Well, what the old PR did was it was trying to flag. Casts that may not be portable across platforms. I'm not sure. I don't remember exactly. Like generate, like generating warnings. 
So lossless conversions were implemented. Conversions that go between like U size to U, U size to U32, uh, things like that would get worn. Let's, um, I think I would be good to see like a little, I thought this issue was a little light, like now that we have this RFC, like, unless it's exactly covered in the RFC, I wasn't really clear what, what it meant to resurrect that PR. Presumably it wasn't do exactly the same thing. I, have, I haven't even read this RFC, so I have no idea. So the RFC, you're talking about the portability lint RFC? Mm -hmm. So the original pitch of the portability lint RFC was to detect code that was compiling on your platform, but would not compile on other platforms. So for instance, you build on Linux, but you have no CFGs that are saying you uh, are limited to Linux and the code you've written will not compile on Windows because it's importing something that doesn't exist on Windows. So in the context of these type conversions, the premise is, well, if you're writing a U size to, uh, uh, if you're writing a U64 to U size conversion, then that will work fine on a 64-bit platform, but unless you've done something to prevent yourself from running on 32-bit platforms, you should get a warning to help you understand. Right. The flip side of that, and the part that I think is worth a little special consideration here is, um, I think the domain of like, I only run on 64-bit and don't care about 32-bit is the domain of the portability lint. There is a specific case that comes up occasionally that uh, I think is worth us considering carefully. We currently don't, uh, we they don't include conversions, safe conversions that can't fail for you size that make the assumption that U size is at least 32 bits. We allow for the possibility that you might be on a platform where U size is 16 bit. And that one is sufficiently rare compared to how often it comes up that it's worth considering, is that the domain of a portability lint or is there some default that we should have that says, okay, unless you're specifically opting into extremely tiny address spaces, you don't have to deal with U size being smaller than 32. I'm not, pre I'm not trying to prejudge an answer there. I'm trying to state the issue. And that does come up often enough. And when people run into it, they're often uh, mystified by the fact that Rust theoretically runs on 16-bit platforms. Yeah. I actually don't know offhand of a 16-bit platform on which Rust runs and would be interesting to interested to learn of one. Uh, I believe there's some people using Rust on the MSP 430. Ah, that makes sense. I mean, personally, I would love to try to get uh, uh, Rust running on the, uh, the Rico 5A can't remember exactly the um, the SNES processor because it would be fun to run Rust there. But I also don't expect most people's code to take into account 16-bit addresses either. So do you think, am I correct that it's really unclear what exactly the behavior is being, we're talking about adding here? Uh, so it needs some clarification. But I think there is value in evaluating the U size concerns specifically as somewhat separate from the portability lens in that we should ask, should you have to opt into or opt out of U size potentially being 16 bit? I think it's reasonable to expect people to have to opt out of U size being 32 bit if they want to do casts that assume it's 64 bit but I think it's reasonable to consider the question of whether U size being 16 bit is common enough to force people to deal with it when they want to convert U size to U32, for example. Right, I, I think there or was, Rica. I'll have to review the RFC. I was hoping to see it real here right away. What I, 
I do remember this being an explicit concern that was discussed at the time, and wanting to have a sort of notion of mainstream, like mainstream portability versus exotic portability, and because the the bar to maintain the ladder is significantly higher and right, and significantly less important to most people. Um, uh, Does this come up very often? I, I feel as though it. It doesn't. What is this in that sentence? Sorry. Like U32 to U size conversions. Oh, I, I feel like mostly you, you are in U size and you, you remain there. So I have multiple times found that this isn't the case. Uh, one notable issue is that only U size can be used as an array index. So if you try to index an array with something else, you'll find yourself doing a lot of as casts. And I would love to use safe into casts that will give me a compile error if I do something that might break. But when it comes to U size, a lot of the intos that you would expect to work don't. Isn't, aren't there try into intos? Uh, remember that you're in the context of an array index. So if I have to write dot try into dot unwrap, let alone dot try into question mark, that's a lot more cumbersome than no, really, I know this can't fail. It's also a drag. Right, but like, but like really validated statically than anything. But like, the, these are the cases where you need to do a conversion and you don't already have a, have a use size. So, and but you so my question is no. Right, like a lot of times, you only need to if you think that use size might be 16 bit. Exactly. I actually genuinely want the compiler to give me a warning if I assume that U size is 64 bit, unless I explicitly opt into saying, hey, I actually know for this project I will never run it on a 32 bit address space. But I don't especially want the compiler to say, hey, wait, pointers might be 16 bits. It happens a lot when you're trying to save space in your data structures, I think. At least that's what yeah. I or when you're trying to uh, enforce properties about your data structure in, a, uh, in the type system, like this thing is never supposed to be more than 32 bits, so I'd like to enforce that. That is somewhat specialized, though. It's not especially uncommon. It's one of those things. It's specialized until you're doing it, then it's your code. Um, <laughs> yeah, there you go. But I, for some reason, I'm not able to type efficiently into Dropbox paper here. But so I didn't take any notes on this because I don't know what's going on. But we're at we're at time here. I would like. I don't know. I don't. I'm. Somebody want to leave a comment saying something? I still feel like I would like to just see what exactly is being proposed. That's my general take. Uh, before I say yes or no, and if I like it or not. But, Maybe Josh, you had opinions. Um, I guess I would say yeah. leave comments on your own. We don't have a meeting conclusion here. That's fine. I, yeah, I think that's. I think so. Sounds good. You don't have one. All right. Um, we can move. The, let's discuss design meetings. Um, I have another. So, meeting too, so we are not having a design meeting next. Uh, Next Monday, then. I don't think let's have one next Monday, but let's talk about it after that if we want to do things. Um, all right. Okay. See you all later. Bye.